Wow. Wow. How good is it back to be, be back in person? Um, did my first in-training event last month for two and a half years. Uh, did my first in-person conference for almost three years. It's so good to be back with people. Um, so thank you to Add Your Temporaire for organizing this. Thank you for uh, inviting me. And thank you for turning up as well. Oh, where's this speaker? The uh, clicker. <sighs> Over here. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh. The big green button. Did that? No. Nope. Tell a joke. Oh, there we go. So, my name's Darren Wilmshurst. Uh, I used to be a bank manager. Spent 16 years in retail banking. I ended up as a senior bank manager in the UK. I had nine branches, 140 staff. Uh, banking was all good until the 1st of November 1997. Not that I remember the date. But that's the date they decided to automate my job. So some bankmen are really good at lending, some not so good. I'd like to think I was in the former rather than the latter. But if you wanted a personal loan, an overdraft, a mortgage, everything got credit scored. The computer said yes or no. So overnight, I went from being a bank manager to effectively a sales manager of financial products. I didn't want to do that. So I made the entire logical leap from move from banking into IT. That's where I went. And I spent uh, almost 12 years in the IT industry. I did a number of uh, head of roles uh, in, in, in IT. Until 10 years ago, when I decided to move to the dark side of consulting. So I joined RadTac 2012, and I've had the privilege and pleasure over the last 10 years to work with some amazing organizations, both in the public and private sector, to help them become more effective. And that's my aim. And we always talk about, and the goal is being about being more agile. The goal is not being about more agile. The goal is about making organizations more effective end-to-end -end as well. So, the last two and a half years have been tough. We have faced a global existential crisis. On the 23rd of March 2020, the UK went into lockdown. Primark is a major UK retailer, shut its doors on the 23rd of March, and it shut its doors to 375 stores. At that time, the weather in the UK was really good. It was really hot. So my wife said, I need to buy some more T-shirts and some shorts so I can sit outside. So she went to Primark online. They had no online capability. They did not open their doors until six months later. During that time, they reportedly lost a billion euros in revenue. They survived. They survived. But Mick Kirsten, in his seminal book, Project to Product, said, a period of frenzy growth is turning into a mass extinction event for those companies that do not learn how to connect business operations to software delivery. Those that master digital business models and software at scale will survive. Many more will fortunately not. I'm always t tempted to talk about BMW. BMW no longer talk about being a car manufacturing company. They talk about being software on wheels. If you look at a premium, company, if you look at a premium car now, it has 100 million lines of code in it. An autonomous car has over a billion lines of code in it already. The CEO of BMW said that half his staff will be software engineers. This organization didn't survive. Arcadia, a massive retail empire, it collapsed. His head was Sir Philip Green, a complete Luddite. He scoffed when ASOS started to sell fashion online. So people will never buy fashion online. I've got a 20-year-old daughter. 
every day, packages come through from ASOS with more and more dresses and skirts coming through the door all the time. And probably one of the industries that was most hit during the last two years was the airline industries. Our skies were empty. We didn't see planes traveling anymore, and they are still struggling. I'd no longer check my baggage into the hold because there's not enough baggage handlers to support it, and you never know whether it's going to make it to the other end or not. A lot of cabin crew have left the organization and recognized there's better opportunities not in the airline industry. We were talking last night about pilots decided to retire and still not, and they haven't had the capacity to fill those pilots. And now we're seeing the airline industry really struggling to, to return to normal operations as well. So at last, at last, we're seeing organizations that realize that they need to change. And this is not just about agile ways of working. This is not just about digital transformation. This is about a root and branch change to the way they operate. Done badly, you can destroy years of hard earned success. Done well, there still might be growing pains. So I'm gonna talk about our approach, which is not based on theory, but on practice. Something we started before the pandemic in the travel industry, something that we refined and honed in a government organization over the last 18 months, and something we are now applying in a major uh, airline company in the UK as well. What was key about all these organizations was they did not want change done to them. They wanted us to teach them how to fish rather than the fish for them. My goal was to try and deliver change in an agile way and create an organization that could sustain change going forward. Unlike many organizations that do change in a waterfall way, they create, uh, they design everything up front. They create a completely fictitious plan and then they create these independent siloed work streams to implement the change. And then they wonder why change never happens as well. So our approach is based on uh, the work by Professor John Cotter, who first exposed this in a Harvard Business Review paper in the mid-80s, and then published it as a book called Leading Change in 1996. He has since updated some of those principles in his book Accelerate, which I think was about 2014, and more recently, his book Change in 2021 as well. Leading the change is eight steps. Establish a sense of urgency. Why are we doing it? I go in lots of organizations, I go, um, so what do you want to do? So, well, we want to work in an agile way. I said, well, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, we'd like to implement SAFE. Okay, I'm pretty good at SAFE. Um, why do you want to do it? Um, because all the other organizations are doing it. It's not a great reason. We need to understand why we're doing it. We need to create a powerful guiding coalition that's going to drive that change. Talk about that more later on as well. We need to obviously develop the, uh, the vision, the strategy, and it sounds really simple. And when you've done that, communicate it. Now, we employ bright, intelligent, articulate people, and we do change, and we don't tell them why we're doing it. How inspiring is that as well? And then, we need to, empl uh, to em uh, empower employees to broad-based action. What that means is we need to get out the way. Where there are systemic and organizational impediments, we need, as leaders, to remove them as well. We need to create short-term wins. 
not long-term wins. We need to show that we're creating progress early as well. And then we need to consolidate those gains, build on them. And then finally, we need to uh, anchor the, the a culture in the new ways of working as well. And culture change comes last, not first. I have to go into organization. We'd like to change the culture of this organization. And we'd like to buy some culture, please. Can't buy culture. If you want to change the culture, you have to change the habits and behaviors. To change the habits and the behaviors, you have to change the systems and the ways of working. And the only people who can do that are the leadership. You start to change the systems, and behavior, uh, systems, you start to change the habits and behaviors, you start to change the culture as well. Good news is, we're not going to do a deep dive in all, to the, in, in all of the eight steps. You can buy the book and read the book for yourself to do that. I'm going to focus on one of the key things that I think where organizations have the greatest opportunity to improve. So for me, one of the critical steps is about creating a powerful guiding coalition. And this is where most organizations fail. We must have heard about it, you know, if, it, it would only work if only leadership were involved and supported us. So I'm going to spend time looking at that particular step as well. What we often see is that when we start to lead change, we have low credibility committees. They haven't got the power to do it. That never works. Or something else we see is that someone suggested to a boss, there's an up and coming leader, maybe a new staff officer. Why don't we ha have him lead the change? Sort of altered by maybe some consultants and, and maybe some people in the organization. And that enthusiastic leader will make some progress for a while. But he hasn't got the top three or four executives that can make the decision. And then what we find is that the chain starts to lose impetus and momentum. From the outset, the group never had the credibility necessary to provide a strong leadership. Without that credibility, you have the equivalent of a 13-wheeler truck being propelled by a lawnmower engine. John Cotter, throughout his book, talks about this analogy of, this, 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 uh, of a vehicle where the organization is the vehicle. The change is the direction of travel, and the leadership is the engine that provides uh, the, 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 the power to that, 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 that vehicle as well. So our view, my view, on approach to a sufficiently powerful guiding commission has three parts to it. And I'm going to go through each of these in turn. First of all, an executive action team. It's an EAT. A change team. And also, finally, non-executive directors. Now, that may be a term that may be not familiar to you. It's very familiar in the UK. But effectively, external advisors. Let's go through each of these in turn. So the EAT. The reason I love this term, and yes, I did nick it from somewhere else, the reason I like it because it says exactly what it says on the tin. It's executive team. So we know that, th that they have the, the power and the position to make those changes. Because they're executives, this is not a full-time role. It's a part-time role. Talk about it a little later on as well. Um, they have to do actions. They are not an inaction team really important. And believe it or not, this is really hard for executives, they have to operate as a team. How, how cool is that? In the organization I was in, the, gov in the government organization, this consisted of five one-star generals that covered the breadth, length and breadth of the organization. They used to meet for 30 minutes a week. They would get briefing notes beforehand in terms of the things that we wanted to consider, some of the issues that we wanted to solve. It was facilitated by someone from the change team as well. But they had the position power to prioritize the work, remove, systemic, remove those systemic and organizational impediments, 
and also provide the intent for and communicate for the change as well. Change team. Uh, anyone familiar with SAFE? Put your hand up if you're familiar with SAFE. <laughs> anyone not like SAFE? <laughs> um, if you're familiar with SAFE, um, you might have heard the word lace. Um, I really don't like the term lace, and I'm a SAFE fellow. Um, one, because I always explain what it means. And then once you explain what it means, that's, that's great in the first place. And then most people change it to a transformation team, a, a COE, stuff like that as well. Um, the change team is very similar to the concept of a lace and safe as well. This is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, these are the people that we are running the change, those change experiments. I'll talk about it later on as well. Uh, they will also be coaching and advising uh, the EAT as well. And, and significantly, uh, they'll be communicating the process of the change as well. So they are the, this is where the real rubber hits the road as well. Um, small teams uh, should be a mix, um, but we recognize in a large organization where lots of change going on, it might not be just one team. You might have a number of change teams. Uh, in the one that we did before the pandemic in the travel organization, we actually create them as a team of teams. Uh, we create them as an art. Um, we're doing something similar uh, with the airline industry as well. So just recognize it, it may not be one team, depending on the size of the organization, the chain, it might be more than that as well. And the term that, that we use is non-executive directors. Um, it's very easy, uh, if you're working in an organization, to work in an echo chamber. You hear your own voices and you think you're doing the right things as well. And what we want to say here is we want something that provides a conscience to the eat some critical feedback as well. Now, that might be someone within your organization that has demonstrated some transformation benefits elsewhere. That might be a good critical voice. It might be somebody uh, from a similar, in, uh, a similar type of organization. Uh, so we were working with uh, the Army, so maybe getting someone from the Navy to come and help uh, and give a critical voice. So something that's slightly different. Um, it might be someone from a completely different organization. Uh, we, we were toying with getting Amazon come in to help with um, the government organization that we're working with as well. Or it might be just a, a, a really experienced, hardened uh, consultant to come in and, and do that as well. But what we want is just someone just to provide some conscious and critical feedback uh, to the EAT as well. So that is the powerful guiding coalition. Executive action team, the change team that's doing the, the, uh, the actual change on the ground, and then that critical feedback as well. So how do we manage the change? And this is where we find organizations uh, have a real pain point. Uh, and they get consultants in, like ourselves, to help them manage the change because they struggle trying to sequence the activities of change. So we thought, well, why don't we use a portfolio Kanban board to help them uh, visualize the change and those change states from ideation all the way through to completion. So I'm going to just take you very quickly through some of those steps, and you'll recognize that they start to talk to some of the other steps within the Cotter's eight steps as well. First of all, really important, first job role of the eight is, what is the vision? Why are we doing this? Let's make sure we can communicate it as well. And we like to create those as strategic themes, as OKRs. What are the objectives? and what the key results, so we know whether these things are starting to turn those dials as well. Next step. We have to have a mechanism where all ideas are welcome and could come from anywhere. In order to change organization, not all ideas come from executives. They can come from anywhere. So we need to create somewhere where somebody can say, I've got a good idea, why don't we do this? It might be a SharePoint, it might be Google Drive, whatever it might be, a mechanism to it. And all we want then is a simple one-liner. First we do that, we do a triage of those one-liners. Will that one-liner deliver 
that strategic theme. If it does, great. Is it desirable, feasible, sustainable? If not, we won't do it. Um, I'll give an example. Uh, we're doing a major change in a ferry company. This is back in early 2000s. Uh, we survive um, the loss of duty free. Uh, we survived the introduction of the Eurotunnel. But in early 2000s, the low cost airlines came in and started to eat our lunch. Ryanair, EasyJet. All of a sudden, you could fly down to the south of France for 10 euros, 9.99, as opposed to getting on a ferry from Dover to Calais and driving the 10 hours to the south of France and driving all the way back again. Uh, and as an organization, we were really fat. Um, we were so fat that we didn't have an expenses policy. You could spend whatever you liked. They were the times. So our CEO said, look, we've got a problem here. Uh, and we've survived these two major events, but now these, these, these airlines are coming, low cost, and they're starting to eat our lunch. We need to get leaner. So can you give me ideas about what we can do to become more cost effective? Now, at the time, the cost of a barrel of fuel was $160. And we burn a lot of fuel, oil, on our ferries. So one of the ideas was to convert all our ferries to nuclear. OK. <laughs> not feasible, not sustainable, probably not desirable. So it's easy to realize them as well. But some of those, those ideas will have legs. So now we go to the next stage where we create what we call an epic hypothesis statement. Just a one pager. What's my elevator pitch for this change as well? And more importantly, what do we believe as a hypothesis our outcomes will be? And even more critically, what are the leading indicators that will tell me as we start to do this change that I'm going in the right direction, wrong in the wrong direction? Now, we're very good at the first part in terms of what I think the change will deliver, i.e. the outcome. We're not so good at the leading indicators. So we're very good at lagging indicators, not so good at lead indicators. So lagging indicators tend to be um, uh, outpoint orientated, but very difficult to change. Lead indicators tend to be input orientated, but very hard to measure. Let me give an example. Uh, COVID has not been kind to me. I've put on quite a bit of weight. Not happy about it. Don't feel proud about it. So I want to try and lose some weight. So I get get up every morning, I could jump on the scales, and I can get my weight. It's a lagging indicator. There's nothing I can do to change it. I can stand on one foot, I can try and balance differently, but my weight's my weight. Leading indicators would be calories consumed, calories burned. Difficult to measure, because if I go to a restaurant and the calories aren't listed on the restaurant menu, I don't know how many calories I consumed. I might do some fitness, but unless I've got one of these that tells me how many calories I've burned, I don't know. So when we think about when we start to do our changes, I, yeah, I know what the benefits are, but how do I know that I'm progressing in the right way? This is where now the EAT will be involved and say, OK, we've got these, uh, these epic hypothesis statements. Um, I've got some good ideas here as well. They will go into an experiment backlog. And this is where the need will need to prioritize those experiments. Which ones do we think have the greatest chance of success? And which ones do we want to fund as experiments? So that's the first thing they need to do. They've done their intent. Now they need to prioritize those experiments. And we run those experiments. This is really critical. Now, we're not going to run change. It's going to run for months or years. We're going to run a small experiment to see whether this thing has got legs. Maybe a small slice, maybe some analysis, in order to prove those initial hypothesis or otherwise. Is it starting to deliver those leading indicators or not? The ones we're doing in the government, we would not run an experiment for more than three months. Those experiments would be run by the change team, and they would be reporting back 
to the executive action team frequently in terms of the progress that they've made. At the end of that experiment, which we agree how long we decided to fund it for, they will then develop the lean business case, and when we will decide whether we pivot without mercy or guilt, something we're not going to take on any further, or whether we persevere with that, that change and instantiate it across the organization. So it now goes into another backlog, even though it says experiment backlog. It shouldn't be experiment backlog, it should be the transformation backlog. It's a bit embarrassing. Transformation backlog. And again, now we prioritize it. Uh, one of my uh, favorite authors, a, a guy called Jeffrey Moore, uh, and he always says that a, ch a hen can only lay one egg at a time. And yet we go to organizations and they try to run multiple change, uh, change activities at the same time. It's very disruptive to the organization and they can't cope with it. So we need to make sure that when we start to prioritize and start to instantiate that change across the organization, it's something that is sustainable by the organization as well. This is then when we mean that may need to scale up our initial change team. And for want of a better term, I talk about maybe an enterprise change team as we start to roll this across the organization as well. Something um, that always frustrates me, and those from the IT industry as, as well will know it, is that, that you know, we, we have this concept of when we do development and we chuck it over the wall to operations. Uh, and there's a massive divide, cultural divide between development and operations. And we're obviously probably all familiar with the fact of that when we're moving to a much more DevOps way of working, where we combine the two as well. In the same way with change, I don't want change team doing the change and then chucking it over to our PMO office. There we go, done the change, now you run with it. So for me, it's really important that we have a similar concept where the APMO, Agile Pro, uh, Pro, uh, Program Management Office, is, in, is, is embedded with those change teams from the get-go and not something we hand over as well. So where does that sit in terms of the other steps? Well, yeah, we've got the vision. It needs to be communicated. That's really important as well. Um, the change team, this is where we create our short-term wins. We start to prove or otherwise whether those things have, have legs or what. We consolidate those gains. We persevere this particular change. We can instantiate across the organization. And then the critical role of the APMO is to make sure that we anchor the new approaches in the culture. We do not want cultural entropy. What do I mean by that? If you weed a garden, get rid of the weeds. If you stop weeding, the weeds go back. If we start to make a change, we need to make sure that we embed that change in organization. It's very easy that having made all that hard work for people to slip back into the old ways of working. So we need to make sure that we instantiate that change in the organization. How are we doing questions, Stu? As a reminder to everybody, um, here in person and online, uh, do go to the Hopping app and check it out. But we've also got a nice little box and Rob, who can bounce that uh, catch box around the room and ask some questions. Um, before we jump to questions, it won't be long before break. Can I remind you, when you do get a break, uh, to go and visit um, Reactor for a nice little coffee and also the um, Ethicodes DevOps sauna for getting insights on transformation and software development challenges. So lots of nice things to come. As for that, please raise a hand if you have any questions. Go on, go on. Oh, right in the front. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm just curious. Um, when you start those experiments, yep. have you actually find out that one experiment which is like very useful? Uh, we, we find a, um, a range. We find some experiments that are not useful at all. We think they were great ideas. We start to run them and they go, not delivering the benefit we want to. 
Uh, but we do find a number of experiments actually have start to prove that hypothesis. So absolutely right. Now those experiments, and uh, as, uh, to my experience, probably 60 to 70 percent of the experiments persevere. 30 to 40 percent we bin. Okay, um, I'm kind of looking for an example. So like one good one to start with. Oh, okay. That's probably harder to, to, to explain, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious <laughs> that I know I'm still working for these companies, and I'm, I'm conscious that I'm, I'm under NDA as well. So, um, yeah, um, um, maybe we'll have a side conversation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Careful. More questions? I think we've got some at the back. Hey. Uh, is this a microphone? Or? Yeah. Oh, right. Uh, on the first slide you showed, I thought there were the two things that stood out to me was one, uh, empowering employees to implement change. I can't remember the exact word, but it was empowering employees. And the last sentence on the last paragraph was uh, cultural change, or culture. I mean, one uh, saying that I learned from Amazon, what got it, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yeah. I think it's so empowering. And have you ever encountered organizations where you just feel the culture is not receptive, we will not be able to implement because the culture is too hierarchical or... Yeah, and Look, uh, yes, um, probably every organization I go into, but again, I suppose, I think the, the one thing I think the pandemic has been has been a, a real boot camp for those large traditional legacy organizations big organizations that felt that their brand was so strong that they, they couldn't be beaten. And I think the pandemic has, 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 they has woken up the fact that there are other companies that are coming out and eating their lunch as well. I think the quote you had was from Peter Drucker, uh, uh, Culture Eat Strategy for Breakfast. Um, and yeah, and it, it's, it's hard and, and culture change does not happen overnight. It takes a, a long time to, 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 to realize. But I think the key thing here is, is that what I said about if you want to change the culture, you have to change the habits and behaviours. And if you want to change the habit behaviours, you have to stay in the systems of work, the, the system and the ways of working. And the only people that can do that are the leadership. And if you haven't got leadership on board to do that, then you can have as, as, as much good intent as you want, but it will never happen. Um, bad example, but I'm going to give you an example anyway. Um, I was teaching uh, a class... Um, way back when, uh, and this was, uh, I was teaching with a doctor of psychology, um, and he used to be a massive smoker. He said, I used to smoke 40 cigarettes a day. And people say, no, that's really bad for you. You know, that's really bad. He goes, I know. Stop smoking. I, no, it's really bad. He's going to ruin your health. He goes, no, I, I don't care. But then all the organizations said, well, actually, what you can't do, you can't smoke at your desk anymore. But what we have done, we create a little smoking room at the end of the corridor. So he said, OK, well, OK, a bit of a pain now. I can't smoke at my desk. I have to go to the, you know, the smoking room. So and now I probably, rather than smoking 40 a day, I probably smoke 30 a day. Then he said, well, I actually can't smoke inside the building anymore. You have to smoke outside. We create a little bus setter for you outside and do that as well. So that was further for him to walk. He said, well, actually, I went down to about 20 a day, but in the winter it was really cold, and I went down to 10 to 15 a day. And in the end, they said, actually, you can't smoke on company premises. You have to smoke outside. He said, in the end, I gave up. Because the, 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 they changed the system. And the system changes habits and behaviors. And he stopped coach smoking. And that's what we need to do in organization. But the only way you can do that is if leadership are on board in order to make those systemic changes. If you haven't got that, it won't happen. That's why I think the executive action team are so important. This is why I find most organizations fail, because they haven't got that powerful guiding coalition to make those systemic changes. We have one more question. We've got a question here coming in um, from online. We are familiar with con continuous development. This change management flow has certainly a certain vision of the goal, but how to manage continuous change in this rapidly evolving business and tech environment? Um, I'm in the twilight of my career. Um, so I started in the bank in the 1980s, and there was no change in the banks in the 1980s. We used to open our doors at 
9.30, we used to close at 3.30, had an hour for lunch, never worked at the weekends. And all of a sudden then, the banks needed to change. So in the 90s, we started to change. And I remember people saying, when's this change going to stop? <laughs> and, 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 and it was like, well, it's not going to stop. And actually, I think change has accelerated um, and is a constant. Um, I think the danger is that if, if you believe you got to a state where you're OK, I think that's a complacent state. And I think what will happen is then, then people will come and, and eat, your, eat your lunch as well. We've seen that a lot as well. So for me, I think we constantly need to think about how we stay ahead of the curve. So change is a constant. And I think what, what I'm trying to say here is that change needs to be like development, that we're continuously changing and, and updating the ways of working to stay ahead of the crowd so that uh, those organisations don't come and eat our lunch. Lots of people eating people's lunch. Yeah. There are. Um, quick question from me, actually. So this is, the, is this your first conference since COVID? Is this your first face-to-face -face conference? The first conference since uh, October 2019. Wow. That's a long... You look, you look younger. You look younger. I just look younger. <laughs> Thought it'd be nice. But, but longer, but yeah. fatter. Maybe. Maybe. Well, this is it. So a lot of people were saying that, that, Ag that COVID was almost like boot camp for Agile. Have you noticed a significant change in organizations and their behaviors, as you said, and culture and the behaviors of people that has sort of almost accelerated the, um, the need for Agile? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I said it already. I think, I, think, um, I hate saying that the, the pandemic has been a boot camp for Agile, but it certainly has. But for, for me, um, people might be familiar with the law of dispersion, uh, the early adopters and stuff like that, and the, the, uh, the early majority and the late majority. Um, I think in a pre-pandemic, we're probably in that early majority stage. Uh, what we're finding now is that we're in that late majority stage. So those big legacy organizations are now realizing that they need to change. So I think in answer to your question, Stu, yeah, I think the, the pandemic has, has really got into that late majority organizations. And they're hard because they're big, big organizations. Um, awesome. And another one coming in, thank you very much, is um, have you got any tips on how to anchor the change? Uh, I, I, again, I want to just re repeat what I said as well. Is, um, most, <laughs> if, if you're an agile consultant um, and you go to an organization and you find out there's a PMO in there, um, most people will say, try and ignore the PMO because they'll get in your way. That's not a good strategy. Uh, they will get in your way and they'll make life really difficult for you. Actually, it will be the reverse. They can be your friends. So if you want to make sure that you want to anchor the approach in, involved, then make sure they are part of your change as well. And they can really help you to make sure that you anchor that chain. If they don't, they will drag you back into the old ways of working. Excellent. Any more questions? Now is your moment. The spotlight is on you. We've got, we've got a bit more time. It'd be great to hear your thoughts on the talk or your general thoughts on, um, yes, on it. One over here, lovely. Okay, I would like to hear your best practices for prioritization. Uh, some tips on that. Okay, so, um, so uh, the, 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 I tell you what I don't like. Um, I don't like the hippo. You've heard of that, the highest paid person's opinion. We see a lot of that. Um, I don't like the zebra. Uh, zero evidence, but really arrogant prioritization. Uh, I don't like that as well. So I try and make it economic. Um, so when we do prioritization, I'll look to Don Reinerson, I'll look at cost of delay. Um, actually, he talks about weighted shortage job first as well. So I, I will use that as a technique to prioritize based on um, the value that we think we're going to get, the time it's going to take, the criticality, uh, the opportunity enablement, and also the effort to do that. So there is a, a way of economically prioritizing some of those change. And that's really important when we look at those epic hypothesis statements, so we understand the effort and the value that we're going to create as well. So don't do it based on opinion, try and do it on economics. Thank you very much. We've got one more question uh, coming in online, and then we've got another question over here, which is wonderful. Darren. How do you handle That's communication? The first time you've called me Darren. Daz, was it, too, was it nice? No, it felt uncomfortable. Did it? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll know for that. Darren, um, uh, how do you handle communications, meetings, newsletters, and things like that? General dialogue through the change work. Thank you. 
something we did, and it was, it was really a happy accident. Um, so again, if we're doing a major change, I think um, the first thing we did was like a major town hall, so uh, uh, something that we talked to the whole company as well. Um, but one of the happy accidents that we did, certainly with the, the, the government client as well, was we started to arrange uh, a briefing session uh, every Wednesday at 9 o'clock for 30 minutes, where people would talk about what they're doing in the change as well. Um, what happened was, a couple of things was really interesting. First of all, we had about 30 people turn up. By the end, we had hundreds of people turning up, doing it, so it was, it was, that was interesting. Uh, they would talk about what they're doing, uh, but then we had 30 minutes of questions. Uh, and the questions were where the gold dust was. People would start and say, well, what about this and what about that as well? And, and in the end, actually, people were answering their own questions as well. Uh, and then we used to record them, and then the amount of views that we used to get was, was, was amazing as well. But what was really interesting about that was not that that was a, a, a communication tool, um, not that, that it, the interest grew in terms of uh, the, the, the people attending and asking questions and then watching the videos afterwards. What was really interesting was the amount of pull that created about the organization. Oh, you're doing this. You've solved that problem. Can we have that problem sorted for us as well? So actually, if you get it right and you communicate it and you start to the benefits, rather than have to push change, change gets pulled. And then the issue for us was, was then managing that level of disruption in the organization as well. So yeah, the agile briefings, or those briefings, once a week, 30 minutes, 9 o'clock, 30 minutes was just was, uh, was really a happy accident that we didn't we just thought, well, we just, we just try this stuff. Excellent. Thank you very much, Nassar. We've got one more question. We've got time for a question from the booth over here. Yes, so the last question is, uh, what if there is a need for a multicultural org organization? How to start developing such an organization? Wow, multicultural organization. Yeah, if there is kind of this uh, um, uh, valid need for uh, different cultures within the organization. Wow. I don't know. Um, can I think about that? I have no idea how you do it, okay, a multicultural organization. Interesting to have a chat with you, maybe. And understand the context a bit more. Wow, that's a great, great finish, isn't it? It's a question. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Well, it's a, it's a, good, uh, it's a good time to say that coffee's Thank you, necessary. Anyway. Maybe coffee, <laughs> coffee and a sauna. Um, but yeah, diversity is the name of the game. So that's what we really want to get. We don't get all the learning just from the talks. We're going to get it from the rich discussion. So please use the apps, have those corridor conversations. And a massive round of applause for Daz. Um... <laughs>